The Slovenian band Leibach was formed in the year 1980 and quickly became notorious for their, quote, hyper-literal repetition of the totalitarian ritual. They were known to imitate fascist and Nazi aesthetics in their music videos and performances. The unique aspect of Leibach, and what made them so controversial, is that they weren't simply engaging in an ironic imitation of totalitarian ideology. Unlike this cartoon from 1939, the point of Leibach's performances weren't to make fun of totalitarianism and the authority figures associated with it. So what exactly was the point of Leibach? What were they trying to say? The problem was that they were so dedicated to their performance that many people were unable to determine whether or not they were being serious. While I doubt that many people genuinely believed that the band supported fascism, the fact that they never explicitly distanced themselves from it created a nagging uncertainty. And even on a more practical level, many people were worried about how other people, particularly young people, would interpret the band. What if their performances were taken seriously by one of their fans, who then went out and committed an act of violence in the name of overthrowing liberal democracy? In the wake of a wave of controversy, a fellow Slovenian, philosopher Slavoj Žižek, emerged to defend the band from their liberal and conservative critics. Žižek used the concept of subversive affirmation to defend the band and situate them within social theory. He not only rejected the idea that Leibach's performances promoted fascism, but he even claimed that they were being more subversive in undermining it than most of its modern critics. The following is a definition of the concept of subversive affirmation from an article entitled Subversive Affirmation on Mimesis as a Strategy of Resistance. Quote, Subversive affirmation is an artistic and political tactic that allows artists and activists to take part in certain social, political, or economic discourses and to affirm, appropriate, or consume them while simultaneously undermining them. It is characterized precisely by the fact that with affirmation there is simultaneously taking place a distancing from or revelation of what is being aff affirmed. In subversive affirmation there is always a surplus which destabilizes affirmation and turns it into its opposite." Unquote. In subversive affirmation, one identifies with a particular ideology, but this becomes an over-identification that undermines the ideology itself. This functions best within, within an ideological matrix that contains its own ironic distance towards itself, as subversive affirmation does away with any such distancing. In his 1989 text, The Sublime Object of Ideology, Zizek talks about how cynicism is a new form of ideology. Quote, Cynicism recognizes it takes into account the particular interest behind the ideological universality, the distance between the ideological mask and the reality, but it still finds reasons to retain the mask. This cynicism is not a direct position of immorality. It is more like morality itself put in the service of immorality. The model of cynical wisdom is to conceive probity, integrity, as a supreme form of dishonesty, and morals as a supreme form of profligacy, the truth as the most effective form of a lie." Unquote. Cynicism is the ideological means by which an authority maintains power despite not taking itself seriously and not being taken seriously by the people it subjects. But the very surplus created through this cynical and ironic distancing is what allows authority to function as powerfully as ever. This authority functions even when everyone knows and talks about its immorality or its scandalous behavior, because the very form of recognition is the surplus that allows the ideology to function. In order to demonstrate this idea, let's take a modern example of this phenomenon, namely the Jeffrey Epstein scandal. In 2019, Jeffrey Epstein was arrested for allegedly engaging in the sex trafficking of minors. Long story short, he was going to testify in court, and he had a list of extremely powerful and famous people that he claimed were involved in his sex trafficking ring. He managed to kill himself while in prison in August of 2019 before he could testify in court. He had actually attempted to kill himself only a month prior, but was unsuccessful. 
After this attempt, he was put on suicide watch, but almost immediately taken off of it for some reason. We're told that he managed to commit suicide by hanging himself with his bedsheets. We were then told that the two guards in charge of watching over him had both fallen asleep while he was killing himself, and the cameras in his cell experienced technical issues, so there was no usable videos of the alleged suicide. Now, it was obvious to anyone with a functioning cogito that something suspicious was going on here. According to one poll, only 16% of Americans believe that Epstein died by suicide. This means that most Americans either believe or unsure whether the government engaged in a conspiracy to cover up the crimes of many powerful and famous individuals. As one would expect, the cultural reaction to this scandal was immense. Everywhere you went, you were confronted with the phrase, Epstein didn't kill himself. It was painted on buildings, blurted out on national television, and, most significantly, it was a joke in Ricky Gervais's 2020 Golden Globes monologue. Contrary to the beliefs of many who see Gervais's speech as a moment of genuine rebellion, my contention is that Gervais is actually engaging in cynical ideology. As I write in my book, Aphasis, The Impossibility of Subjectivity, quote, Gervais's confrontation with the truth, his cynical irony and nihilistic attitude towards the crowd of celebrities, was nothing more than an ideological surrender, an empty gesture towards the rabble. It is a telling fact that he admits that there is a high probability many of the individuals in the audience were implicated in the scandal, yet it still remains, at its core, a joke, nothing more than a provocative comedy routine. Unquote. The fact that there were barely any repercussions for the people involved in the scandal is proof of the ineffectiveness of this sort of cynicism. For most people, simply being able to exclaim the truth in public was enough to satisfy them. Now let us imagine if Gervais had used the tactics of subversive affirmation at the Golden Globes. What if he simply went up and explained the situation without a trace of irony? He would have said something like, Billionaire Jeffrey Epstein killed himself on suicide watch after both guards watching him fell asleep and the cameras stopped functioning. Obviously, it would have to be more subtle than that, but in any case, as opposed to engaging in cynical ideology, he would have been forcing people to confront the absurdity of the situation in a more direct way, one that doesn't include the surplus of ironic distancing. Now, to return to Leibach, we can now see why their tactics of subversive affirmation were more effective in their critique of authority than Gervais's were. On the topic of Leibach's political art collective, NSK, Zizek says the following, quote, NSK frustrates the system, precisely insofar as it is not its ironic imitation, but over-identification with it. By bringing to light the obscene superego underside of the system, over-identification suspends its efficiency, unquote. Unlike Gervais, Leibach truly frustrates the system because every system contains a hidden, obscene superego that cannot be made public or else the system ceases to function. To over-identify with the system is to affirm it in totality, which includes its obscene superego underside. Now let us talk about the recently deceased comedian Norm Macdonald and how he got cornered into engaging in subversive affirmation himself. In 2018, Norm found himself in some hot water. This was near the height of the Me Too movement, in which many celebrities were being exposed for abuse or inappropriate behavior by their alleged victims. Thankfully, Norm was never directly implicated in any scandal, but he did get in trouble for defending his friend Louis C.K., who had been exposed for sexual misconduct. Norm made some comments that were grossly misinterpreted by the media, and he was forced to apologize for them. He had essentially said that none of the victims of abuse understood what it's like to be crucified in the public sphere. However, a lot of people interpreted him as saying that the victims had it better off than Louis C.K. and the other perpetrators, which is not what he said. It should be noted that this is right around the time Netflix was preparing to launch Norm's new show, so obviously this controversy was not appreciated by the Netflix executives. So he went on the Howard Stern show to clear the air, and he said that you must, quote, have Down syndrome to believe that the victims had it better off than the perpetrators. 
So now he had to apologize again for this comment, because now he got even more backlash and his appearance on The Tonight Show was cancelled. He had to go on The View in order to both clarify his earlier comments and to apologize for using the term Down Syndrome. It's important to emphasize that Netflix was preparing to release his show, and it's very likely that if he didn't apologize, they would have cancelled it. So he was essentially forced into apologizing unless he wanted his show to be cancelled and his entire production team put out of work. The only problem was that Norm didn't feel bad about his comments. He didn't believe there was any reason to apologize. We know this because he used the term Down Syndrome in his stand-up routine both before and after his appearance on The View. So he was in a tricky situation here. He had to apologize, but he wasn't actually sorry. For your average person, this probably would have resulted in a half-hearted yet satisfactory apology. But for Norm, it unknowingly led him to engage in subversive affirmation. It must be noted right away that for most of his interview on The View, Norm isn't being insincere. When he's discussing Roseanne and Louis C.K., you can even see the sadness in his eyes. Because I was really concerned uh, about Roseanne and, and, and uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want someone to end up killing themselves or anything. Of course not. We also can see in this following clip that he truly wanted to clarify the comments he had made as they had been completely distorted by the media. But when, you kind of lose me when you imply that the hardship that your friend Louis C.K. is a friend of mine too, really, uh, I know him a long time, uh, that the hardship that he went through uh, is equal to the hardship that the victims went through. Right. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't compute. No, it's not can true. Can you explain yourself a little there? Yeah, uh, 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 no, it's not, that's not what I was saying. I... Oh. So he's not being completely insincere the whole time. In fact, the only time he clearly is, is when he's apologizing. There's a clear shift in his attitude and language, along with the fact that every time he says something outlandishly absurd and out of character, he pops a mint. Like, reporters always ask you, like, what's offensive? Is anything over the line? And I personally think uh, almost everything is over the line. They yeah. like it. What Norm just did was subversive affirmation. Because despite the fact that most of his fans recognized that he was joking simply because of how out of character he was acting, no one on the panel caught on. Well, except for maybe Joy Behar. Now, earlier we talked about how subversive affirmation functions best when the ideology it is subverting contains its own cynical distance towards itself. But it's clear that this is not the case with the women on The View, and that's because their ideology is political correctness. They were taking the moral side. They were denouncing Norm's comments, even though they accepted his apology. Remember that Zizek considers cynical ideology not to take morality seriously. But again, this very clearly doesn't apply to political correctness, because political correctness takes itself seriously. It genuinely sees itself as having the moral high ground and opposing evil. They are good, while the people, language, or actions they denounce are bad. But nonetheless, even though the women on The View weren't engaging in cynical ideology, subversive affirmation still functioned here because of the ridiculousness of the situation. It still functions by affirming the ideology and exposing a truth not immediately present to those who either take it seriously or those who criticize it from outside. In this case, as opposed to subversive affirmation functioning to remove the ironic distance and expose the ideology's hidden truth, Norm's performance simply takes the ideology to its logical end. They wanted him to apologize for his comments. Well, here you go. Here's a beaten down old man apologizing for the quote, terrible, terrible, terrible things he said. The remark I made about um, people with Down syndrome mm -hmm was uh, just a terrible, yeah. terrible, and terrible stupid. thing for me to we say. Agree. Well, all of this is happening. <laughs> yeah. You know. Here you're experiencing the results of political correctness and cancel culture. Here you got a straight white male apologizing for his terrible comments. While politically correct people outwardly despise people like Dave Chappelle who make politically incorrect comedy, what they don't realize is that political correctness couldn't even exist without people like him. The essence of political correctness is being in opposition to that which is politically incorrect. 
So all Norm did was simply affirm the ideology. To once again quote the paper Subversive Affirmation on mimesis as a strategy of resistance, quote, Thus, when speaking of subversive affirmation, we are not dealing with critical distance, but are confronted with a critique of aesthetic experience that, via identification, is about creating a physical-slash-psychic experience of what is being criticized. The aesthetic experience of political correctness, taken to the height of absurdity, is what Norm engenders with his demeanor and comments. In this way, he undermines the ideology and turns the mirror back onto itself. Just as Leibach, quote, does not function as an answer but a question, unquote, Norm's appearance on The View is a question, not an answer or an apology. The topic of his appearance was why Norm is apologizing for his statements, but through subversive affirmation, Norm turns this into a question. Why is Norm apologizing for his statements? When you think about the situation critically and do some research on it, you realize that Norm had no reason to be sorry, or at least that's what the majority of people who weren't involved in the corporate media thought at the time. Anyone who knows anything about Norm understands that he was a caring and generous individual, and that he never intended to hurt anyone with his comedy, especially later in life. As he himself once said, the goal of comedy should be to make people happy, to make them smile. Thank you so much for watching everyone, I'm very excited to announce that all of our Patreon tiers are now open, so please consider joining if you have the financial means to and enjoy our content. Also be sure to join our Discord and follow us on Instagram. The Telosbound Philosophical Association is now open, more information will be available here on YouTube soon. See our associate page on telosbound.com if you'd like to check it out yourself. That's all I got for today, I hope you enjoyed the video. And may God bless you all.